I would like to walk you on a tour through a, um, uh, a uh, particle filter model that we've provided for you in AnyLogic, which implements the basic mechanisms, and highlight for you further a set of documentation that indicates for this model, if you'd like to adapt it to your needs, what things you need to modify yourselves, what things can be taken directly, you can just copy them for your own use, um, what things that you will need to adapt for your needs, and, and then um, I guess those are the, the two major categories, each of them have some sub, um, sub components. So the model that I'm going to be going through is a model that uh, we have provided to you within a folder of the participant, uh, the participant area. Apparently, I discovered earlier today, and Cheyenne and I worked through, that that model, if you downloaded it before about half an hour ago, there was a problem, apparently one of the files, the so-called jar file got corrupted. And I went and I replaced it and things were fine. Um, uh, both Cheyenne and I verified that it was just a corrupted file. So um, in order to find these materials, I just highlight them for you. If we go to the participant resources for the boot camp, and if you go to the example models, you will find that there's a folder called example particle filtered model, okay? Um, and I would like you to right click on that if you want to follow along and run it yourself. And I'd like you to choose download, okay? And it's gonna say zipping new file, okay? Because it's gonna turn it into a, an archive file, a zip file. And unfortunately, I found that sometimes it can be quite slow in this regard. So you might want to start soon so that it will um, finish as soon as possible. So what did I do? I right-clicked on example filtered model. I chose uh, download. It, it said zipping one file. And now it's asking me leave site. And uh, that's its basic way of asking me for permission to download it. So I'm going to say leave and here it is it's being downloaded okay so i just downloaded that whole folder as a zip file and the reason i did that is that having so done i can now go and uh and ex ex and, and unzip uh that model okay so uh i am going to go and hopefully i didn't get rid of it here, there we go. So here it is. I'm going to go to my downloads and I'm going to say extract here. And it's going to extract that for me. So again, what did I do? I went to the participant resources, I went to example models, I right clicked here, I said download. It went and downloaded it after saying zipping one file for a little bit and went and downloaded it. I then went to my download folder and on my system, I said extract here. And it'll say, okay, I already already did it, so it's uh, complaining. Okay, here we go. Um, oh, okay. What, what am I, I just went to a different folder. Here it is, right there. So I've downloaded it. That's great. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do now is go and open that in any logic. So I've called up any logic. If any of you would like to follow along, you could call up any logic yourselves. Having extracted it, I'm going to open the associated model in the folder that I extracted in any logic. So once again, go to participant resources, example models, right click, download, it'll zip it up put it out in your folder, go to that downloads folder and right click on that thing you downloaded and do extract here or however you do it on your system. And then you have that folder and we'll open it now in any logic. So I'm gonna do open. 
I did control O or you can do file open here. I'm going to go find it in my downloads. There it is. There's the folder and here's the so-called ALP file. I'm going to open it. Boom. Okay. Now it's open. Okay. And uh, I'm going to, I don't have to, but I'm going to say build model here. I may not have to do this. So clicking on the model, there's a little thing up here. It says build, it shows ones and zeros, or I could say model build off of the file. Okay, so this is a model that's of a particle filter, okay? Um, we have the latest version of AnyLogic, which unfortunately has issues in showing the 2D histograms with high relief. Um, this is an issue that's been brought to my attention by Wade, as well as Winchell. Um, it, is a, um, it is an inconvenience for us here, but it doesn't stop it from operating correctly uh, at a mathematical level. So if you'd like to see the particle filter in operation, you can go down to this training new, and you could say run. Pure is it without the particle filter, training new is with the particle filter. So I'm going to say run. And here we see this model running um, over time uh, according to certain dynamics in the stocks. The stocks have bars, those represent different particles. And what you'll see is that it's simulating out successive months. I just got to this by clicking this here uh, on the right hand side, okay? Um, so, so this model is, is running and you'll notice that it's reporting on what it's doing. So it's saying receiving an observation at time four, it's reporting um, the observation, it's saying that I am resampling, it's saying some description of the weights, et cetera. Um, okay, now this model is in short running through a particle filter. You will actually find up above a depiction of this and unfortunately it's hampered by this issue with this particular that's emerged in this particular uh, version of any logic um, that it's not showing the colors with great clarity but there's actually some blue here that doesn't show up well on your on this big screen shows up a bit on my my own screen that shows the kind of distribution um, by contrast, we have the empirical data uh, shown here over time, etc. And uh, suffice it to say that it's, it's following this out. So I'm not going to dwell on the output of this model, but I want to walk you through a few key things about this model. A few key places that it does undertake its key tasks, okay? With an eye towards not necessarily you knowing right now what it does in all its detail, but knowing where to start and knowing about this reference that I've provided right here. I've provided, oh, I've provided it to you in your reference folder and together with this, um, um, with the code, in the code base folder, I, I provide these things. So we're gonna walk through just a couple of these, okay? Arguably the single best place to first look is this thing that says process new empirical observation for particle filter. So if I go and I select this and I copy it, by the way, you can go download this file as a PDF if you'd like to do so in your participants area, reference decks, and there's a thing called elements required from U of S particle filter model. So if you select the first of these, and then you go to the model over here, the AnyLogic model for particle filtering, which is really kind of a template, and you were to search for this, I'm going to say search, and here we are. It finds a reference to that, and you can see it's right here. There's also an event which calls it, okay? So this event goes off periodically on a cyclic basis and it goes off every reporting period in months, months, 
So it goes off uh, according to a frequency set by a parameter called reporting period in months. It fires in, and it says, hey, I'm receiving an observation, and it's going to call down. If the particle filtering is being performed, it calls this process new observations from particle filter, which is exactly that thing we we're, for which we are searching. Now, if you're new to any logic, or even if you're familiar with it, but you haven't explored this feature, I will note that by holding down the control button, I don't know what it is on Max, but by clicking on it, you, um, uh, maybe it's command, you can actually go click on this thing and it will bring you to that function. That's just the thing I clicked on. Alternatively, I could have gotten it, or sorry, searched for, I could have gotten it here. So this process new empirical observation for particle filter here in this. Basically what it does is periodically it's invoked, it gets the current time, and if we're still performing particle filter, in other if it's otherwise it, if it's within the simulation time horizon, confusingly called update weight check time for no good reason. <laughs> it's like a historical vestige. Um, it's like the lizard part of its black brain and lives on and it's called check time without good reason. Um, uh, then it'll call update weights based on observation. And then if the compute effective sample size reports something less than a minimal effective sample size, it'll go through a resampling process. So this is where it updates the weights for the observation of all the particles. And after those updating the weights, if the effective sample size is too small, uh, too small it would go through a resampling process. Remember this? So, so when it gets a new observation, it updates the weights, renormalizes them, et cetera, and it only does resampling for particle filtering, not particle and CMC, but particle filtering only does resampling if, if the effective sample size is less than some minimum that we could specify, okay? Um, it will call this. Now, before going on, I need to explain how particles are captured here. Because you might look, be excused for looking through this, and you see references to particles, but where are the particles? You could go all around here and be looking for the particles. Where are they? Where are they? Are they over here to the left? I, I don't see the particles. And you could be excused for missing them. You could even go look here within main to try to find them, like in the functions or whatever, and you're not going to find them. They're not among the system dynamics elements. Where you'll find them is actually there's a thing called dimension, and there's a thing called particle. Okay? And this whole process weights for observations, we're referring to particles, and these particles are captured in a dimension. Here, these particles have numbers associated with them, 0 to 999, which is 1,000, okay? Computer scientists like to label things starting at 0, okay? Mathematicians like to label things starting at 1, and this is a point of some tension between the disciplines. Now, uh, um, this, this um, uh, is an indication that particles are a dimension. You say, what do you mean? What sort of dimension are they? That's kind of a strange construct, perhaps, it may seem to you. Well, let's go look. So the key thing to look at here is, is the stock and flow model. Over here, and because this monitor is particularly, this screen is particularly limited and almost sclerotic, it's, I'm just going to zoom in on this, okay? So I went and I, I'm kind of browsing around this thing called main. To, to, to lower confusion, I'll, I'll close all these other mains um, that are here because we really don't need them around. And I'm going to go zoom in on this main. So all I, I did is when I opened that model, you can alternatively uh, click on main, I believe, but in any case, you can open main up and I'm gonna double click here. And what you'll see here is that there's a stock and flow model. You've seen this, see me draw this very many, many times, right? Here it is, right here, right? There it is, and stock and flow model, S-E-I-R. This is Shaoyan's 
aggregate measles model. Okay, um, and I included the example paper, the paper that refers to this published paper. Okay, so we have susceptibles, exposed, infectious, and recovered. These are stocks, and these are flows between them. We talked about that in the first day. There's some number of people who are susceptible, some number of people exposed, some number of people infectious, some number of people recovered. For each what? Particle. Particle. Each particle has a certain number of people susceptible, exposed, infectious, and recovered. Remember, each particle has a view. <laughs> each particle has there. Um, just have to look close enough. So each particle has some particular value for S, for E, for I, and for R, and secretly there's some dynamic parameters, okay, which are, which are there as well. They're actually in the upper left. Log disease transmission rate, which is a one called beta, okay. Um, here it is, okay. And there may be one or two more, too. The point is, remember each particle, like this is particle one, it has all of these, and it has a weight. Let's go see where that is, okay? Where, where are the particles here? Okay, well, you'll notice that each of these is subscripted. In short, each has a dimension, one or more dimensions associated with it. And I'm gonna go zoom out from this by double clicking on it. I'm selecting I'm selecting this susceptible here. Hey, get back there. Um, susceptible. And you'll notice that it's arrayed by, in other words, it's subscripted by particle. Okay? So there's one of these per particle. It's like we have a subscript. Um, they're susceptible for, susceptible for sub P1, susceptible sub P2, susceptible sub P3. In other words, each particle has a value of this. And it turns out the same thing is true with exposure. Okay? It, it also has a value for each particle. So does this flow between the two of them. It's subscripted by particle. In short, it's almost like there's, if you look at this model, it's almost like there's a, this is a layer cake. For different particles, there's a separate value of infectious. Okay, um, and they flow along this spine of the model here according to each particle. Each particle flows along in parallel here, and of course they stop at observations, right? And, and uh, they're updated, their weights. So, so here we have SEIR, and you'll find the same thing is true for like uh, up here on the upper left, okay? Um, for this um, disease transmission rate. I guess it's log C instead of beta. Excuse me, it's, it's uh, log C. Um, okay, so, so in short, um, each particle has a copy of all these things. So this is a particle view of the world. It's their vector, okay? Now, beyond that, each particle has what? What does a particle have to its own besides a complete view uh, of the world as it is now? At a certain time, it has a certain belief about the number of people in the susceptible stock, the exposed stock, the infected stock, the recovered stock, log disease rate, and there's probably one, one other uh, over here, like reporting rate. What, what else does it have besides that that's absolutely critical, ladies and gentlemen, to the functioning, here it is, um, this is this fraction of reported cases per month, and same cases per month. So what is it besides this that it, it, um, that it has, that every particle has bequeathed to it? It has a what? A weight, a weight. So this is logit if F is also an element here. Yeah, logit of f. Okay, so that's our particle. See, it has a weight. Ladies and gentlemen, it has a weight. Okay? Um, so there's some weight. And where are the weights here? Well, the weights, ladies and gentlemen, are in a place called weight. <laughs> weights. 
And if I go search for it and I search for weights, I will go find under variables, there are weights. Here we go. And this is a little bit of confusing thing, but basically there's this many, however many particles there are, there's that many weights. That's what that initial value thing is. This is treated a little bit differently. It's not a stock. It's just, it's a, as we say, it's kind of a vector. It's, a, it's called an array, technically. Okay. So here are, here are the weights for each particle. Each particle is one of these. Particle one, particle, the first particle, the first particle's weight is in index zero of this. The second particle's is in index one of this, et cetera. Okay? Um, so, so now we're starting to see some key elements that we should recognize. And now we could start to look in a little bit more detail at some of these things. We saw earlier this process new, new uh, empirical observation for particle filter. It called off. So it was called periodically by receive empirical observation when data is available, and it calls it. Here it says, "Hey, hey, go if it's if it's performing particle filtering, process the new observation for particle filtering." This process the new observation for particle filtering. It says, "Look, if I'm still before the time where I finish my observations, if I'm not in the prediction interval, if it's beyond update wait check time, I'm in the prediction interval." But if I'm before that, I'm going to update my weights based on the observation. If I go click on that or control click, hey, there I am. Update weights based on observation, okay? Um, that's this one here that I refer to. Here, okay, here I loop through the particles in turn. And each particle, basically, I'm computing their likelihood, okay? Um, uh, here and it's based on a negative binomial distribution. So I'm calling it off saying, hey, go compute your likelihood. And there's some additional components here, but basically I have a prior weight, a weight that it was before then, and the posterior weight is just um, the, the likelihood times the prior weight. Hmm? That's where it is, right there. Um, and then I assign, I update its weights to be given by the posterior weight. Okay, that's what the, the, that weights thing. And then I'm totaling it up. And then at the end, I normalize the weights according to the total weight. So the, because this, they're not necessarily normalized, so they sum to one. And so then I go through and I normalize them. I make them sum to one, okay? Um, and that completes the weight update, okay? The, the update is based on the likelihood. Um, this will have to differ um, in terms, the, the likelihood would have to differ a little bit in terms of the specifics. This likelihood of total reports given incident case count negative binomial. Hey, yours may be very different than that. And if we go click there, this is where we, we compute the negative you know, the Pascal distribution, the negative binomial distribution. It'll compute this. So this, the job in life of this function is to compute the likelihood function um, based on um, some observation from the world and based on some model expectation and some, um, some dispersion parameter, it computes the likelihood function. So these are all examples. I don't have time to go through this exhaustively, but these are examples of these sort of items that are here. You'll find others for other steps of the process. For example, initializing uniform weights, resampling indices, sampling particle with a probability according to its weight. You don't have to line up your earphones on the ground and do eeny, meeny, miny, mo. We have code to do that in an automated way. It doesn't sing that song to you, but you know, if you want to extend the model, you're welcome to do so. So sampling particles by weights, that's implemented. Resampling the indices, resampling and updating the weights, um, uh, resampling indices from an index, uh, et cetera. So normalizing the weights. So these things are, are, are implemented for you. You can pretty much use them as you w want. Um, uh, update weights 
based on observation, technically this needs to be modified slightly for your cases. Modify slightly uh, per your needs of calling, calling your likelihood function because it may take different numbers of arguments and so on, okay? Um, and you notice it referred to the weights here and the dimensions, the particle. Now there's some things that you're going to need in more detail, like there's this thing called get empirical data for current time. Let's go, let's go grab that. Get empirical data for current time, here it is. Here's a function, and this is going to get a sort of the data point for the month. And it's actually looking it up in something called table function empirical data infective. And if I go look that up, what I'll find out is that it's kind of a, a lookup function. Here's the table data. We can go see a nice picture of it here in the preview area. There it is in all its glory. This is our empirical data about um, new infectives, incident case counts over time. Okay. So it's looking that up as part of its function uh, for this um, get empirical data for current time. It kind of looks up, what time am I at? And it looks up here and it gets the empirical data for that time. And your data, you would need to have your own data put in here right? for, for your needs. So that's the basic uh, picture of this. So there's some things that you do need to, um, to do more. I wanna highlight this one uh, in my final comment here. There's something called update particle values with resampled index. And notice I make a comment in this file about how you have to modify it. So um, uh, here are the values of each stock are gonna be dealt with. And let's go see it. Let me correct that misspelling, terrible. Um, so uh, here we go. And we will search for this. And uh, it is one unhappy camper. Okay, update. Um, why is it not finding it? Update uh, with resampled indices. Okay. Uh, well, I'll be. Okay. Um, uh, I could go down and track that what this is. Uh, can any student help me find this right away? Mm hmm? It came up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it could be on Google by this point. Uh, I do have a video about this that uh, um, update particle values for the sample. Okay, it was a lowercase u, uppercase u. Thank you. Okay, if you look at this, you'll see some things that might need to be, will need to be updated. Uh, if you're doing if you have a highly stratified model, like age and sex, if you have a stratified model, this needs to be handled in a bit of a extra care. We can provide you with models like this if you're interested. But basically, you need to have arrays for each of the stocks of your model because you're gonna need to update, this is update particle values with resampled indices. So you, you're gonna basically need to update the, the values of the particles um, based on the resampling. So this is gonna have mothers, for example, state copied to their children. And the problem is we, we don't wanna overwrite the information about the mother because there's someone else who will take her spot at that index. And so basically you need to have a set of temporary variables here, temporary arrays declared up front, and then you go through each particle and you, and for each particle, you get the updated values uh, for that, um, excuse me, okay, so yes, uh, you find out where it came from. So you're considering each new particle in the, the children's array, the new generation. So for each particle in that array, you're gonna find out where does that particle come from? In other words, who's their mommy? Who's the mommy of this particle? And having found that out, you will then copy the information from the mother to these temporary variables, okay? So you'll kind of squirrel away the information about the mother here um, for that. And, and 
Once we've got all that information squirreled away, then we don't have to worry that it'll be overwritten. And so then we go through the particles um, in the, uh, and you can see the comments here, having gathered all the data in the temporary arrays, we don't have to worry about overwriting it in the original variables. Here we can now update the state accordingly. Um, uh, that is for particle i, which is told to assume the value of its mother, particle j, we overwrite the states of i with the states of j. And so then we use the values we squirreled away to write to the uh, stocks themselves, um, the updated values. So uh, here we don't have to worry, we've overwritten, we're gonna overwrite something because we've, we've copied the values that were in them to these temporary variables. And so for your case, like you're gonna have different things than ex susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered. You'll have different names. Maybe yours will be, you know, um, uh, asymptomatic and symptomatic, or maybe they'll be uh, pre-diabetic, diabetic, diabetic uh, normal glycemic, and diabetes with complications. But the point is that you will need to um, be updating uh, your, your stocks, and in the process of updating your stocks, you don't want to destroy the information about the previous generation. So this top area here, these temporary variables allow you to store away the information in the previous generation before you start to clobber the values of the stocks, before you start to overwrite the values of the stocks. And that's what you do, okay? So this just has to be adapted to your context. And as they say, I think it's part of the, lot of the, um, the kind of uh, motto of the University of Sydney, in fact, um, mutatis mutandis. You, you just adapt the inessential things, um, but keeping the, the basic logic is the same. You're just adapting which particular stocks there are in your model, et cetera, okay? So that's how this works. Um, I think the idea was University of Sydney was supposed to be like Oxford, but just with the inessentials, you know, changed. Um, uh, okay, um, so, that's how that works. Um, uh, if anyone's interested in learning more about this model, um, uh, you're welcome to play around with it. Uh, this is, again, a published model. It's a model that therefore has some care that's gone into it. And um, it's also a model which people in my group should be able to help you interpret. So um, you should be able to run it and explore it uh, as you see fit and you'll find these comments um, that will hopefully help you learn your way around it, okay? So that's one thing I want to get to you. A little bit of a guideline for this model with an eye towards viewing it as a template that can be adapted. We've taken this template and it's basically provided us the template for something like 10 to 15 models now. We've just reused it, just reuse it. Over time, it's pretty straightforward, mutatis mutandis. You, you just have to adjust things. As I said, it needs to be adjusted a little bit more carefully when you have ages and sex distinctions in the model that are captured with subscripts too. But we have code that does that, and I'd be glad to share it if there were interest, um, if it would help you out. Okay. Um, so that's uh, comments on that model framework. Uh, 